Good evening, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with everybody today. Um, Peter and I, we're not just collaborators uh, as in science. We also uh, co-organize a group here at the lab that is called um, Faculty Advancement Committee, and which is a group that gives our recipes for how we have been developing our labs and growing our groups to assistant professors, people that just join the lab. So um, not the first time that I'm sharing this stage with Peter. Um, Peter, would yeah. you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, so I'm an assistant professor um, since 2019. Before that, my training, my background is actually in experimental physics. That's where I got my PhD at Yale. And then I transitioned into computational biology during my postdoc. I found that uh, AI and genomics were both thriving as fields, and I wanted to explore the intersection of these two. Yeah, so I was born and raised in Brazil. I came to the US in 2005 to finish my PhD at UPenn. Uh, met a guy, never went back. Moved to Cold Spring Harbor in 2008. Um, very happy here. My husband is a faculty here. We live on campus. We raise our two boys here. So for me, I'm so privileged to be part of an amazing scientific community, but also uh, incredibly um, happy and, and lucky to raise my children um, in, in, um, around here. And they actually go to the school district. So um, if you heard of Lucas and Marcos, um, then sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not so good. Um, uh, but they're amazing, a um, handful of amazingness. Um, and if you do know them, please tell your children to tell them that I spoke about to them today. They are all home playing video games with my husband. So thank you so much. We both, Peter and I, we are very interested to understand DNA and how DNA works, how DNA changes from cells um, throughout the body, and how um, change to our DNA can be impacted by lifestyles and um, um, increase the risk of developing cancer. So my lab specifically, we are very interested to understand the intersection between uh, mutations that happen in the DNA that can increase the risk of breast cancer across many um, lifestyle um, events that a woman can go through. And I'm gonna get to them in a little bit with a bit more detail. And my lab, uh, my lab's research lies at the intersection of AI and genomics. And in particular, we, try to, we use AI to uh, help us understand patterns in DNA so that we can understand uh, when uh, you know, uh, certain aspects of DNA are favorable um, or, or when, they go, uh, when they become deleterious and lead to disease states like cancer. But why would we merge two very different skills to understand cancer risk? What I'm showing in this, in this slide right here, it's something that all of us, all of our cells go through every day, mutations. So as your cells divide, sometimes the machinery that makes sure that your, the alphabet of your DNA is intact doesn't work so well. And uh, with research that we've done here at Cold Spring Harbor by many amazing scientists, including Bruce, we understand the, 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 the factors that are important for DNA replication, to keep you know, the alphabet of your DNA intact. But even with all of this amazing kind of uh, sets of checks, sometimes mutations happen in cells. And when that happens, there are three things that can work. Um, so the transformed cells in red, imagine that those are cells that acquire mutation. Oh yeah. So sometimes, most, uh, most of the times, cells that have a mutation, that they are sitting in your tissue, they are surveilled by your immune system. So they just send different signals to the immune system, signals that the immune system have never encountered before. So the immune cells go to them and ask, what are you doing? What are you all about? What's happening here? 
Sometimes that conversation doesn't go very well and the mutated cells get eliminated by immune cells. But actually sometimes they do talk to each other, they get friends. And they, there is just an equilibrium in which a system can live with DNA mutations without turning into cancer cells. And that equilibrium can last for a life, uh, 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 for a very long time without the development of cancer. Alterations in that conversation, meaning that more mutations could be acquired by the same cells. Alterations to our health, for example, you, your immune system doesn't work as well as used to before, can allow those cells to escape, and that's when cancer is developed. So we believe that understanding why the, immune, the, the cancer cells talk to the immune cells, how immune cells can decide when to clear those cells out of the system and how to keep an equilibrium, and how to prevent the escape is the way not only to understand how cancer is developed, but to think about ways to screen for better screens for cancers, but in perhaps in the future, which is one of our goals, to think about how one can prevent cancer from developing. And in my lab, we apply that specifically for breast cancer. So uh, one in eight women will develop breast cancer throughout their lifetime. Majority of women are at a risk to develop breast cancer when they are around the age of menopause. 70% of those women that develop breast cancer, they will respond to the first class of treatment. So science has done an amazing job on describing and research new ways to treat cancer. Unfortunately, 30% of women that get treated, they do relapse to the disease coming back. So from a perspective of prevention and treatment, as we have to keep putting effort towards understanding better way to treat uh, cancers that develop in women. One should also think about prevention, primary prevention, so we do not develop cancer at all, but also preventing disease from coming back. What is most striking to me is that we all in this room here know of somebody that has developed breast cancer. We all know. And we still don't understand for why, the reason for why the majority of women do develop cancer. So what I'm showing here in this pie chart is 30 to 40% of women that do develop breast cancer, they have a risk factor. They have a family history, they have a mutation that predisposes them to develop cancer. They have some sort of health impairment that put them at risk to develop breast cancer. 60 to 70% of women do not have that history. They do not have um, uh, family history. They do not have no mutations that could increase the risk to develop breast cancer. And all we are left with is screening, self-examination, and mammograms. So then we are we, with the hope to catch the cancer at a point where treatment can be more efficient. And I believe that understanding what modulates the risk in cancer in women overall, independent of you having a, a risk factor or not, would enable us to understand and to be more proactive. Because let's be clear here, we have to be our own advocates when we can go for our own health, right? And if it requires us to understand our own risks, that it varies uh, you know, um, throughout, across every single one of us, we should be better um, equipped to um, be our own advocates. All right, so it doesn't make any easy this slide, right? I just told you that majority of women develop cancer without knowing that they have a risk. And then we have several factors that can decrease the risk, but also increase. But it's not that they are 100%, right? It's not that, you know, after you leave here, you go have your cocktail. You're gonna have cancer. I assure to you, not. Moderation is my word. So it's not gonna happen that. It's not everybody, and unfortunately, not everybody that exercises is also you know, protected from developed cancer. You hear stories of women that have been athletes. They, they have been doing exercise their whole life and they still do develop cancer. 
And our job here, our goal is to develop modeling systems that then we can, you know, put little animals to run and look at their breast cells and look at the DNA of their breast cells before they're turned into cancer, understanding what's happening inside of those cells. So then we can better understand alterations that could increase the ability of mutations to happen and um, the immune system not to clear them. As Bruce mentioned, one of the things that I focus the most is pregnancy. But we have been developing now models that we can understand other types of lifestyle events that a woman go through. Um, aging, menopause, depression, all of those change our body. And yet we don't quite understand if they play a role in increasing the risk of breast cancer. And if they do, what is it changing in our body that, that increase the risk of cancer? Pregnancy is what I'm gonna talk about for the next uh, minute and a half. Uh, the, in this plot here, we have years on this X, and here's the incidence of cancer if a woman never had children. What we have in, in, in uh, blue here is actually the focus of what my lab studies is the, bill, is the fact that women that have their first uh, full-term child before the age of 25 years old, they have a decrease in the overall risk to develop breast cancer. Even when they get to the menopausal age where all women are at risk to develop cancer, on first early age of pregnancy decreases. Now, I miss that boat. Can't do anything about it. Uh, but what we can do about it is to understand in, in animal models what happens to their system, to their body, to their cells when we put them through an early age of pregnancy and then ask how then those chains prevents cancer from developing. But when it comes to get to the DNA, right, which part do we look at? There's a word that we use to define the study that we do, which is called epigenetics, which actually is pretty much speak about kind of switches that we have in our cells, switch that will turn the DNA off, so that part of the DNA is not gonna be working anymore, and switch that will turn the DNA on, the parts that will turn the DNA on. And my lab has made observations in parts of DNA that have been turned on and off, that when we manipulate that without pregnancy, then cancers do not develop. But how can we go that throughout the whole genome? And that's when Peter comes into place. So uh, the question is, how can one systematically understand pregnancy-induced epigenomic changes and the role in preventing cancer? So this question is incredibly challenging to answer uh, by any individual lab. And this is why this is a very unique uh, community that we have here at Cold Spring Harbor. Um, where, where scientists come from different expertise, different backgrounds. And while well, Camilla comes here with uh, a biolog biology background with a lot of in-depth knowledge about breast cancer, I come from a different background, from AI, from quantitative biology. And, and, and by, by putting us together in the same location where we can interact with each other regularly, we can find avenues where we're like, oh, hey, the stuff I'm developing can be can can help solve your problem maybe, and so this is how collaborations form at Cold Spring Harbor. So again, my lab's research lies at the intersection of AI and genomics. So you might be wondering, what is AI? And throughout the past year, you probably heard a lot about it, a lot about AI in the media, talking about how amazing and how powerful generative AI has become, and also some doomsday scenarios where people are worried about it, but that's far from reality at this point. Now, um, basically, um, AI, even though we've only heard about it recently, has really been around since the 70s and 80s. But it's fallen out of flavor in the 90s and the 2000s because during the 80s and 90s, during the 80s, they made a lot of promises that AI was going to solve, revolutionize a lot of uh, you know things back then. But they failed to deliver on their promises, and that was known as the AI winter. And AI re really just started uh, coming around again in about 2012. 
And uh, the class of models that drove this uh, resurgence in AI is called deep learning. And deep learning is simply a rebranding of artificial neural networks. And artificial neural networks are really just uh, a model or algorithm or computational program, if you will, of taking inspiration from, ha from how the human brain processes information. And the basic component of a of the brain, oh yeah, thanks. Uh, the basic component of the brain is a neuron. And so we can model that neuron uh, with an artificial neuron on the computer. And artificial neurons take as input data and it performs a simple computation. Now these artificial, uh, a, simp a single artificial neuron really doesn't perform interesting computations on its own, but when we when we connect a network of these artificial neurons into a network, it actually, the computations that they can perform uh, scale in complexity quite dramatically. Now, we want these artificial neural networks to perform interesting computations for us, right? So we need this artificial brain to be able to interact with the real world. So we need an input layer where we can feed in data and we need an output layer where we can get the results of the computation. And an artificial neural network like this is considered something called a universal function approximator because it can relate any inputs to outputs. And the challenge though is that um, these models, while they're function approximators, we can't access, we don't know what functions they're approximating. And so for this reason, neural networks like this are largely considered a black box. Now, even still, uh, even though this is a black box and we don't understand how these neural networks work, that we can still train them to perform interesting computations for us. For instance, we could feed it images of chihuahuas and muffins and have it classify them for us. Or we can use the same network to classify image, uh, whether the image contains a labradoodle or fried chicken. And since this is a universal function approximator, we can also uh, feed it DNA sequences and have it predict um, how strong uh, that DNA promotes mRNA expression levels. Importantly, these, yeah, thank you. Importantly, um, these AI models, as function approximators, right? If, when we train them on genomics data, the AI is essentially um, learning how to approximate the experimental, uh, the experiment, the wet lab experiment that Camilla is generating in her lab. This is actually a really profound idea because it allows us to then use that AI to simulate um, hypothetical experiments. So for example, if we want to understand a DNA, a DNA sequence, we need to dissect that DNA sequence with perturbation experiments where we can turn off specific elements along that DNA sequence and see how it changes the cell's behavior. And doing this in the laboratory is extremely laborious and costly. Now, since our AI has essentially uh, learned how to approximate this experiment, we can query the AI now and ask it, if we made these perturbations, how would that cell's behavior change? And of course, this is all through the lens of the AI. And, and, and in, 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 re in reality, biological discovery comes from the wet lab and so these predictions made by the AI can then be uh, you know, given to Camilla and she can then validate whether they actually you know, are, have you know, protective effects or uh, malignant effects on the cell. And the ultimate goal, of course, is that you know, uh, by understanding, by dissecting these DNA sequences and understanding their functional behavior, uh, we can come up with some uh, actionable therapeutic interventions. Yes, and um, I must say that it sounds very straightforward because he's an amazing speaker. 
by the end. <laughs> so actually part of why collaborating with colleagues here at the lab is because there's like this constant interaction, students get together, you know, we get together, and um, the point here is to push the boundaries of what one can do in terms of integrating an eye and wet bench, um, which are, to be quite honest, if we did not have the structure that we have here at the lab, I would probably have never heard Peter speaking, right? So very grateful for that. Where we are going with that, Peter doesn't know yet that I'm going to ask him to work on another project with me, but now he's going to find out. So we talk about how pregnancy changes a woman's body and how that changes um, the risk of cancer, but all women at a risk to develop breast cancer during menopause. And for those in the audience that um, are not so familiar with that, um, menopause is when uh, the, the period in a woman's life, the estrogen decreases in body and circulation, and that is also understood as reproductive senescence. So we heard Bruce talking about senescence, and this is when uh, women um, uh, cannot reproduce anymore. Um, a household with a woman with menopause, it's not a same household without a woman, with a woman that is not going through. It, if you don't know, it is true. Um, it's so life impairing that affects everybody around you. And um, the only way that we can actually treat the symptoms of menopause is with a hormone therapy, which, what do you think they do? They increase the risk of breast cancer, that's correct. So a woman nowadays, they are presented with the question that of a choice, do you want it to improve your quality of life by bringing back the hormone that life just took it away? Or do you want it to then take the risk of taking the hormone and then develop breast cancer? And a lot of research actually has been done and the cause of the cancer that women taking hormone therapy happens is not because of the hormone therapy. It's because at that stage that they, women start taking it, the cancer has already started developing. So, and we have recently developed a, a modeling system, and when I talk about model, we talk about animals, that can mimic, um, uh, mimic menop perimenopause and menopause transition that a woman goes through. And now we can go and understand what happens to the DNA of those cells, we can understand what is going through the, the immune system of those cells, and now we can put it back hormone therapy and ask which ones are actually the ones that increase the risk or decrease the risk. So, right? You're gonna work with me, right? Okay. Got it. Okay, awesome. Hormones are amazing. So I think that what Peter and I wanted to do today is to just exemplify to you how people that are very interested in dynamics of how DNA work can actually bring together modeling systems that rely on living animals, but also modeling systems that can rely on artificial intelligence to improve our understanding of how DNA works, especially in circumstances that we can understand uh, how disease work, uh, develops. It is right, we did win. And that was awesome. <laughs> So um, Peter and I wanted to uh, acknowledge everybody in our labs uh, that have been doing their amazing research and are just a pleasure to work with. We wanted to thank the lab for giving us the flexibility to develop models uh, that did not exist in the field of science and now allows us to understand uh, complex biological processes uh, much better. Uh, this collaboration uh, was born from our, the ability of the lab to share with us seed funds, which are important support that allows us to develop preliminary data so then we can be competitive at a national level to acquire uh, NIH grant, which we did. So we wanted to thank all of you for keeping, um, helping the lab to help us to help 
understand better um, disease-relevant uh, questions, um, and we are happy to take questions. Thank you.